Hello to all and welcome. My name is Sarah Verbeest, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center. I'm also a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Social Work, and I'm really excited to be introducing this next panel along with my class on administration and management. In preparation, we've been talking about organizational culture and design, and we are all really looking forward to this next panel on building more equitable organizations to support maternal health. To ask questions during the panel, go to the Q&A day one tab on time and find the session title. I am so honored to introduce you to this afternoon's wonderful panelists. You can read much more about them on the conference website. I'm just gonna say a few words about each of them. Dr. Stacy Scott is currently an executive project director and equity lead for the National Institute for Children's Health Quality. She came to NICHQ after 20 years working with Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. In her role, she supports NICHQ's commitment to infusing equity throughout the organization. Divine Shelton is a senior public health project coordinator for CityMatch. His background is in public administration and political science. Before CityMatch, Divine was a member of Senator Claire McCaskill's staff. He has a passion for seeking health equity for disenfranchised and marginalized communities nationwide. And Dr. Nikitra Burse is the owner CEO of Six Dimensions, a certified woman-owned, minority-owned public health research, development, and practice company. Dr. Burse is dedicated to understanding the impact of systems on the health of communities. Her work is centered around health equity and social justice issues and ensuring that populations that have been historically underserved, overlooked, and discriminated against receive equitable treatment in health and healthcare settings. She is the executive producer of the short documentary, Laboring with Hope. The film highlights the issues of maternal morbidity and mortality among Black women. I also want to say that both Dr. Burris and Dr. Scott live very close to New Orleans, and uh, I think it is extraordinary that they have power and that they have um, given their precious time and attention to us today. So I'm really glad that they're all here. And with that, I'm going to turn the panel over to you, Dr. Burst. Thank you. Good afternoon. And thank you all for being here. And thank you for the, that um, those introductions. We really appreciate it. I, I, we were talking before we said we missed because of COVID and now we're having to miss, uh, well, we're in the midst of a hurricane. So, um, but we are here and excited to be here. As we get started, uh, before we really just turn the floor over this panel, I'm really excited about it because we always, when we think about health equity and this work that we do in health equity, we have to realize that that's a lot of internal work that we have to do as well so that we can go out and serve our communities. And so when we think about the internal work, we have to think about the internal work of our organizations. So that's why I'm really excited uh, to talk today and to hear Dr. Scott and Divine talk about their work. And so just a little context, and I'm sure you've already read it, but this panel is building more equitable organizations to support maternal health. We know what the data says about Black and Indigenous women. They're two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women. And so how can we as organizations um, address these inequities? So we, we've been sounding the alarm for several years now. We've been sounding the alarm. Now, what's the action? And so with that, you've heard some introductions. We'll start with you, Dr. Scott, just to tell us about the work that you're doing at NICHQ and how the organization is really uh, working on health equity within the organization. Good difficulty not turning off my mute, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Burst. What I'd like to do is to, first of all, just talk a little bit and give you a little background about NICHQ. Um, and as again, it's the National Institute um, for Children's Health Quality. It's a mission-driven nonprofit dedicated to driving dramatic and sustainable change and improvements in complex issues facing children's health. We have been on this equity journey. Um, equity has always been a part of the organization, but I could say over the last two years, we have made 
a, a significant effort to address um, equity. Um, we've added it into our strategic plan. And just let you know what our overall, I'm just making it real short and simple. Our goal is within Niche Cube is to really work toward infusing equity throughout. Um, and that means through who we are, what we say, and what we do. And we are working to become an equity empowered system that really is purposely looking at how we can restruct, reconstruct systems to really focus on advancing equity and marginalized, historically marginalized and disenfranchised groups, both internally and externally. And we recognize the importance of that. We are looking at our staff, I'm looking at what we can do to empower and help people have a voice to champion equity, um, not only on behalf of the people we serve, but on behalf of themselves as well. Thank you for that. I, I've been jotting down things, so we're going to jump into the conversation shortly. Divine? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for your time. Uh, Divine Shelton. I'm with City Match. I'm Senior Public Health Project Coordinator. Um, if you're not familiar, City Match is a national membership organization of city and um, county health departments uh, uh, dedicated to maternal and child health issues across the country. We largely work in um, urban communities. Um, and I'm the primary coordinator for an initiative uh, called the Best Baby Zone uh, Initiative, uh, BBZ. It's an effort to address uh, the very persistent dispar racial disparities that we see um, across the country in regard to infant mortality. Um, so we are um, I'm very deep in that project right now. Um, we work with teams across the country uh, from Fresno, California to Chicago to uh, Wake County, North Carolina. Um, so that is a, probably a good introduction to who we are and I'm happy to answer questions about our work uh, when the time comes. Thank you, Divine. So you both, um, we've talked about it and uh, Dr. Scott, you hinted at it when you said we were taking a look at our staff. We know that when we build our organizations and build out our programs, whether it's grant funded or however it's funded, we have to select the right people to go into the community to do the work. So can you talk a little bit about what equity looks like in staffing for each of your organizations and whoever can take it away? Okay. Well, I have to say we have worked very hard over the last year in really trying to diversify staff. Um, but we, you know, also recognize that, um, it's not only just for persons of color to carry this torch and that what we've done internally have really worked on how we can educate and empower everybody to be a champion for equity. So although we know diversity is very important, but it does have a tendency, it can be somewhat of a slow process of anything when about human resources and hiring and recruitment. Um, we are not only looking at recruitment, but also retention and providing support to our staff who are coming in. But we've done a lot of work over the last year around just internal equity training. Um, and it goes beyond implicit and uh, Implicit bias training, because even though we know implicit bias training is a good thing, research shows that it really has not moved the needle in which many people had hoped that it would do. So we are really looking at structural changes. We uh, are providing, I mean, we've done everything from um, having um, our book clubs with all of the staff, um, our CEO or NICHQ has provided books. We've read that uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. We have um, uh, monthly uh, equity hours. We're doing a whole series right now on white fragility. We're looking at how we can empower people to be able to speak up when they see inequities. Um, and so I think it's just a combination of a lot of things that we're doing. We also have, um, and uh, we're doing an internal audit. Um, we're looking at um, 
our equity work within our organization. We're looking at our projects to see what or projects have equity focus. And if they don't, how we can hopefully work with our funders and, and see if we can oppress upon them the need to make sure that we are addressing equity in projects that maybe not have had equity focuses in the past. So it's just a combination. And, I, you know, we'll go in a little bit further about that. But I, I'm really uh, excited about what we have been able to achieve and the willingness of not only the staff of color, but all staff that we've looked to be inclusive in helping us in our equity journey. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Divine, did you want to add? Sure. Um, I'll say that I think that the work requires um, uh, inward looking uh, perspective. Um, I think we have various projects here at City Match. And so we're working with teams to address racial um, disparities and inequalities in their communities. And so I think we've done uh, the pre-work of making sure that we look uh, inside our, our own home. Uh, to make sure that we are um, walking what we preach. Um, and so uh, I know we'll go into this a little later, but we, we've definitely as a staff for the last, um, the, the time I've been here, certainly uh, become more diverse um, just in general staff and in our leadership. Uh, but we've also gone down the path of uh, taking uh, trainings together um, as a staff um, and that happened very early on and it, it continues. Um, our, our strategic plan in many ways is uh, encompassing um, anti-racism efforts. We, we've come out with an anti-racism statement um, as have many of the teams um, that we work with. So um, like I said, I think it, it, it also, it, it's just a process of if we are asking our teams across the country to do this work, we need to make sure we are doing it as well. And I think uh, we, we get a pretty decent grade on that right now. Good, and, and you all brought up two really important things. One, Dr. Scott, you talked about diversity of staff and we can't just put this burden on people of color. And thank you for making that statement because that, that's so important. I've been reading lately um, things that come across the Twitter feed and about diversity. And it's it's not just, um, you know, sprinkling a person of color in here or there. It's really about um, the commitment to the organization. It's about who can connect with the community. And it's, it's really about the dedication. So I think when we look at diversity, we're not looking at, oh, we need to bring, uh, you know, all these people of color in so they can fix the problems. And we know that that's not the case. And so I appreciate you for bringing that up. When we think about diversity in organizations, sometimes it is a quick fix to say, OK, well, we'll hire a couple of you know, people of color to work this project, but that's that's not that's not enough. And so as we work with organizations, we have to continuously challenge ourselves and challenge them to really think deeper about diversity. And then the second thing you both mentioned about this internal and inward looking perspective, especially when it comes to training. And we've heard about implicit bias trainings and you know, they are great, but my challenge has always been, okay, what happens after we check that box and we get our certificate and we go about our day? How do we implement these practices within our daily work? And so it's great to hear that your organizations are really committed to those internal um, things, because when we look internally, we see a lot of things we just don't like, and we, we, we have to address those, and it helps us better our practice. Um, you all are saying such good things. I better get back to the questions, right? Okay. So um, one of the things that I really wanted to know was about the challenges that you faced in doing this, because we keep talking about equity and those of us that have been in this work, it's nothing new to us, but it is this um, discomfort now in some spaces that we go into. And so have you all experienced any challenges in your work when it comes to um, equity and developing and implementing programs with equity focus. Mr. Sheldon, you want to go or you want? To I was just going to ask if I could. Go Thank right you. Um, no, I, I, uh, I'll say um, 
definitely, I think you know, any organization when there's change, especially um, change that we're seeing in the larger society, um, there are going to be uh, certainly challenges. I, I'll just speak to um, my work personally, um, this maternal child health, uh, largely being a field dominated by women, there are certainly things that I've needed to, um, for, for uh, lacking another term, check myself with a lot of um, things and, and, and maybe perspectives and considering the perspectives of um, the people, our programs and, and our teams and I serve. Um, and so just learning various different things. I think a, a, a very good example is just language. Um, in turn, we work with teams and spe specifically, um, I work with teams across the country. And so language in this field certainly matters. Um, when I'm working with our team in Fresno or Portland, it, it, the, the term birthing people matters. Perhaps our team in Wake County, North Carolina, doesn't use that language as much. Um, but that language and, and, and the, the proper way to address people and speak about um, issues. Uh oh, light has gone off in here. Excuse me. Um, excuse me. Um, that the language matters. Um, and so that's certainly been a challenge and something I had, I've had to adjust to um, and learn um, about to become better. Um, but at the same time, that adjustment and, and that uh, ability to adjust to the discomfort has made me better at the work that I do. And so I will welcome um, anyone to be a little uncomfortable because that, that, that is also a place of growth. And um, for me, you know, anytime you move to challenge the status quo, um, really to working to build and govern a system that centers on the experience of um, disparity groups, you are going to have some issues. We know that if we're asking people to accept racism and other forms of oppression that inversely impact systems of care, there is going to be a problem. And we are working to place specific emphasis on, uh, again, addressing unique causes of the disparities and inequitable outcomes. Um, we also are really concentrating on sharing um, to ensure that there's representation, also redistributing resources. So, and taking that on as a challenge, well, taking that on is a challenge. And what I have done is coined the term, the equity paradigm shift. And what we are seeing within, um, NICHQ, um, if you know about this, this is kind of a back a scientific statement back in the day where um, they talked about the structure of scientific revolution, not to get all deep, but really talking about that when you see paradigms um, and their shift and there's a um, dominant paradigm under which traditional systems have operated, now is rendered incompatible and there's time for a new phenomenon, it really facilitates addressing a new theory, a new paradigm. And what I mean about that is just because our organization is niche Q, is champion equity, maybe many of our funders and other organizations haven't quite got to where we are. And so this is this paradigm shift of us making a choice based on what we are professing we want to do um, and we see that uh, many of our funders or other supporters are not there, we have to make some tough decisions on how do we move forward with that? You know, how do we stress that? And so, you know, that can really be very impactful when you start talking about relationships and funding and these things. And so um, we are now, as we have made this statement, we've, we've, um, with, with a collaborative of organizations that have actually agreed and signed an anti-racist statement. And so it really puts some tough decisions on us on how far we want to push that envelope, how comfortable we are, and how, you know, I have to say, challenging our bottom line, because if everybody's not where you are, then how do we handle that? So that's one of the major challenges I think that we're seeing and experiencing right now. 
Okay, now, you know, I'm going to sit right there, there for a second, because <laughs> when you talk about funding, funders, um, and how comfortable you are with challenging your bottom line, that they're in this work. And when we try to make these big structural changes, that comes at an expense. And so how do you assess your organization's um, comfort with moving into those spaces? <clears throat> well, you know, I think, first of all, is how viable your organization is and how much you can push that envelope. Um, of course, no, you know, you have to answer to your board of directors. You have to, especially as being a CEO of an organization or in leadership, and um, that's easier said than done. So that's why it's so important that from the top down, from board of directors to everybody, that you get everybody on board and working, as you say, you're going to champion equity. Because you have to understand that there might possibly be some fallouts as a result of that. Um, and, you know, what can you live with? I guess that's the other thing, too. Um, and so, you know, you have to be, uh, I, I believe Mr. Shelton talked about, you know, walking that walk and talking that talk. Um, you have to be prepared for that and you have to recognize that. And so I think it's a balance, you know, and I, I can't say let's go out here and say the heck with it. We're going to walk away from a million dollars or two million dollars. Absolutely not. Because now you have to look at the impact of doing that. And what is the ultimate impact of the people that you service to? Because even though you want it to be equitable, you also want to make sure the services are there for them. And so, again, you have to be very strategic in what you do. Divine, did you want to add anything? I'll just add that um, CityMatch is embedded at a large research institution here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, so it seems to be um, of interest uh, to uh, go down this path um, of pursuing equity. Um, that doesn't make it easy, uh, certainly given the, the part of the country that we're in, um, but yeah, certainly not easy. But I, I'll also add, um, um, I think Dr. Scott mentioned earlier um, about the implicit bias, which generally is um, issues of, of person to person discrimination and racism uh, uh, and discrimination. But I, I think that what we've done a pretty decent job of is making sure that we're looking deeper than that. Um, I, I love the term racism without racist. Um, you can have that um, systems um, can be discriminatory without knowing it or it, it being outwardly done. Um, and certainly at large institutions like a university and, and others, uh, those systems um, can be found and should be looked at. Um, and so that, that's something that we've done internally. Uh, I know Dr. Scott mentioned uh, boards as well. So I'd say maybe two years ago, we undertook uh, the uh, Racial, and I know this may come up early, so I may repeat myself, but um, we took a racial uh, equity institute training with our board. We basically took away time and, and planned a retreat um, and our staff and our board um, uh, used that time to talk about the foundations of discrimination and racism in this country, um, its larger institutional structure, structural effects. And so a lot of eyes were opened um, through that process. I think sometimes in our, our, our discussions about race and racism, discrimination, prejudice, there's so much that's assumed to be known um, in the country that uh, isn't, it should not be assumed to be known. Um, whether you're a person of color or not, there, there's actually a lot uh, to, to learn and to know and so uh, we may go over this later, but the the, institute, or the organization is uh, Racial Equity Institute, and it's a training that we undertook with them um, probably two years ago, and I would recommend it to anyone going down this path. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. 
and divine, you said something that really made me um, think about, you know, these systems. Even if we took everyone out of the system, all the people out of the systems, there will still be inequities within those systems because that's the way that they're built. So thank you all for sharing what you have um, have done. One other thing I wanted to talk about just on these systems and when we start making these changes, we have to embed those changes and we have to put the stamp on them. So have any of you or do either of you have experience or have you um, implemented policies within your organization that, um, you know, focus really on equity? I know we have organizations that are um, moving toward like breastfeeding friendly, um, looking at different types of um, leave policies when it comes to um, pregnancy babies, you know. um, So have you all implemented any policies? that you see being, you know, really a game changer? Um, Well, we're in the process right now. In some of my previous work before I came on to NICHQ, we started what we call the um, equity systems continuum. Um, And with the help of Kellogg and a planning grant, um, we were able to, within NICHQ, begin that process of fully developing. It's a conceptual framework around equity and systems. Um, And so what we are in the process of doing and working with a niche cube is to develop what we call an equity systems audit tool. Um, And we have began to work on that. Um, And this is really kind of helping us to get a better understanding about where we are on the continuum and having us an opportunity to be able to look at some of the uh, practices and of other policies and things of that nature. And so with this continuum, what we're being able to do internally and hope to be able to do it beyond just from an uh, internal but externally is to begin to identify where we are along the continuum, um, be able to consider what some of the current approaches and six successes, what we failed at or what we succeeded at, and really to determine the actions that need to be taken to improve along the continuum. And within this continuum, we have three systems, savvy design, ally design, and equity empowered systems. Um, And we're working now currently on a, a fourth system that really talks about supremacist design system. And what we are doing is really developing a tool to be able to assess where organizations fall within these systems um, and really be able to score them in a way to help organizations um, be able to see how they can address some of these um, issues that we see that brings on around systemic um, biases that we see within organizations. Um, So I'm excited to say that we are, of course, testing it out first internally. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can, you know, it, it becomes successful. That's something that we can share um, with the public at large. Um, but I think we are really on a, on a good way to see, uh, again, look at it from a systems perspective and where we fall along that. Mm-hmm. That's really exciting work. And Hopefully you all will give us your grade too once you finish. <laughs> Divine. Uh, I, I'll say we're in a we're in a similar process. We've been in it for um, probably more than six months now. We're working with um, I'll name another organization, uh, Missouri Public Health Institute. We're going through um, a strategic planning process uh, with them um, to make sure. Um, we exhibit uh, the things that we breach uh, internally. Um, in terms of individual policies, we, <laughs> Juneteenth became a federal holiday this year. That's something we've been uh, uh, recognizing as in organizations, but um, the university, the large university, when it became federal law, um, recognized it. So that's something. Um, internally that we've, we've been um, doing. Um, 
In terms of, I guess, uh, in other things that we've done um, internally, at, I'll mention um, a, a course that most of our staff, or at least our coordinating staff, took in the winter into spring this year. Um, the organization is, is called Rise for Racial Justice. It was um, maybe an eight week long course uh, spread over 16 weeks. Um, and the, the course was, and that there were several, several um, courses, so a plug for them, uh, Rise for Racial Justice, but we took that course um, as a staff. Um, and the, the name of the course was How to Facil Facilitate Racially Just Spaces. Um, our work here at City Match encompasses a lot of um, facilitation. And so it is not uncommon for us the, the issue of race and discrimination to be brought up when we're talking about infant mortality and um, maternal morbidity and other issues. And so that's um, another thing that we've done. But it, I guess as a larger policy, that's just something that we've done as a staff several times, whether it be racial equity institute training, um, the rise for um, rise for racial justice training um, and others. Um, it's just a common part of our work and it's something to be expected and it's something that we refresh all the time. So I know Dr. Bergey made the, the comment earlier, of, you know, you go to the training, you get your certificate. Uh, that's um, in many ways not how we operate. We, we, we continually, continually refresh um, our knowledge in this space because like I said before, the language changes, new knowledge comes out. There's um, new voices to be considered. Um, and I, I think we've done a pretty decent job of that. Thank you. So now we've talked a lot about what this looks like internally. So we do all of this internal work so that we can go out and serve the community. Um, Mr. Chelton, I know you talked a lot, um, earlier, you mentioned the Best Baby Zone program. Can you talk um, a little bit about, and we'll both, both of you will get to kind of the work that you're doing in the community, but um, I wanted to start there about talking about the Best Baby Zone program and how um, those practices that you've worked to establish within your organization translate over into um, good practice in the community. Excuse me. So uh, the Best Baby Zone Initiative um, has been in existence for many years. It was at the University of California, Berkeley, um, and we um, took on the work in the spring of 2019. Um, so I definitely want to credit folks who have been working um, in this space before us. Um, so we have several teams across the country um, and I, I'll highlight our newest teams. Uh, we have a team in Southwest Fresno, California, Kansas City, Missouri, um, East Garfield Park in Chicago, which is on the west side of Chicago, and then Wake County, uh, specifically Southeast Raleigh um, in North Carolina. So um, a, a pillar of the work, a big pillar of the work um, is to make sure that the community has a voice um, in the decision-making um, in many of these, uh, or it can be easy to um, present initiatives like these to communities because there's a problem and people who wanna do good all come together and that's wonderful. And then the people who live in the community had no uh, hand or voice in any of the policies, initiatives, work, procedures, et cetera. So that's a huge part of the work um, to start is to make sure that um, we call it community-driven action to make sure that people with lived experience who live in these communities are working with the public health department. Another huge part of um, the initiative is multi-sector um, uh, collaboration so it is not uncommon for um, a best baby zone in a community anywhere in the country to be working with the school district, housing authority, police department, um, and public health department and the YWCA, all trying to address uh, the very persistent issue of infant mortality in a community. 
Um, but for the purposes of, of, of this question, it is, it is essential um, to make sure that people who live in, live in the community, who have experiences in the community, are a part of driving um, the work that is happening to address the issue. Um, and many times that is just that just being blunt is going to be it's going to be work that's led by uh, women of color uh, in, in, in various different communities. Um, and so I wouldn't doubt that that's led to levels of discomfort for some people, but it, it, it is uh, what needs to be highlighted and what needs to be done um, across the country. So um, that's what we've done with our team, if that sufficiently answers the question. I think it does. And Dr. Scott, I wanted to pass it over to you to talk about any programs um, that may translate over into, into your community work and how your organization puts that those practical approaches in place. Well, I, I'd like to highlight a couple. We, we have a few. I think the first one um, is that our New York State Birth Equity Improvement Project um, is a big, a very important project that we have that we are working with the state of New York. And it's really to combat uh, racial disparities and maternal mortality um, and, and really look at reducing implicit bias in health. And, and, and really, we have seen a major shift because we started out with implicit bias and now we have moved into an anti-racism framework and not we're going beyond maternal mortality but really working at black birthing people um and so this whole project is really looking at working with 123 birthing hospitals and the three birthing centers in the state of new york and taking again uh an a, a improvement um a standpoint, looking at quality improvement and seeing how we can incorporate that in doing PDSAs and, um, you know, of course, all of our learning sessions and action period calls. We, we've we had an opportunity to bring in consultants from all over the country that specify was, well, that um, actually um, uh, really work in this field around birth equity, um, looking at empowering Black birthing people um, and being able to bring the hospitals together to be able to share in their challenges and successes and work together on how we can improve birth outcomes for Black birthing people throughout the state of New York. Um, and so there is a, a many components to that that you know I want to go into, but we are really asking to get the voice of uh, birthing people out of the hospitals by really um, reaching out to them and asking them to report out around how they felt their services were, you know, what can be improved upon. Um, and so I'm excited about that project. The other project that we have, um, which is our National Action Partnership to Promote Safe Sleep Improvement and Innovation Network, is again, looking at it from a quality improvement standpoint that really focuses on making um, breastfeeding and infant safe sleep a national norm. We, again, over the last few years have seen the project evolve significantly, focusing on um, families of color, um, looking particularly in Black communities and American Indians, Alaska Natives, and, and seeing how we can um, infuse equity in all that we do. Um, again, that's a multi, um, multi components within that. We've um, uh, this last year done communities of practice. Um, we have our national coalition. We've had action teams. We've had our cohorts A and B, which were around hospitals, around prenatal and postnatal. And now we have our cohort C, which is really focusing on community driven organizations. Um, that are really working to try to assist in a way um, to help people in taking that whole improvement model standpoint and seeing how you can infuse that within your organization. So um, those are just some quick things. But uh, again, we are, are, have done a lot of things over the last couple of years um, in working with communities to try to infuse this 
um, equity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Mr. Shelton, you talked about making sure the community has a voice in everything that you do. I think that is that's one of the most critical components. When I was working in nonprofit, one of the hardest things to do would be to kind of negotiate with funders. And I mean, we're talking about maybe close to 10 years ago. OK, well, we can't do this because it doesn't translate over into this community. One thing that I'm really excited about now is seeing funders really listen to those on the ground and trust. And so that's what I'm getting at is the trust that we have to build with the community um, to be able to go out and, you know, really achieve our deliverables. But also it's trusting them to do the work and know their community better than any of us know it. And so I really appreciate your organization making sure that you take a community driven approach. And now, Dr. Scott, you talked about the NAPSIN and the cohort C. So I did want to just mention that um, I do have the pleasure of being a part of cohort C. And so a lot of our work, we do a lot around um, storytelling and centering um, Black women's voices when it comes to maternal and infant mortality. And so one of the things that we just kicked off this week um, that's a part of this is we put out some um, professionally produced videos around breastfeeding. And so our biggest thing is making sure that businesses will support not only their patrons or customers coming in, um, but they also support their employees because we know that when moms go back to work that, you know, their chances of breastfeeding significantly decrease. And so we did that first session on, um, on Facebook Live on last week, and we released the video at the same time. And we have that, you know, there have been close to a thousand views of that video um, that we put out. And the comments that came under it were people, HR professionals saying, wow, this is great information. I never knew that we needed this policy to implement in our organization. And I want to take this back to our organization so that we can implement those policies. And so I say that to say in those videos, we use um, regular Black mothers. But guess what? They had been breastfeeding or close to breastfeeding. They were business owners. They advocated for um, policies within a larger health system. One um, advocated for policy change in the, the veterans hospital. And the other has a, a restaurant, a juice bar, and she has created those policies. And so it was really good to see Black moms not only breastfeeding, but in practice in their work. And so I think the, these very practical approaches that we take um, and that's not me tooting our horn for you, Dr. Scott, but <laughs> but these practical approaches that we take and we, when we can do them in this collaborative manner, um, they can yield very great impacts. And when we think about systems, that that's our ultimate goal is to make sure that these systems are equitable. And so when we can put in policies in place and just by centering voices in a video format, that is already taken off to make a big impact. And that's only been about four days ago. So we appreciate being a part of cohort C as well. <laughs> so as we get ready to prepare for questions, one last um, question that I wanted to ask you all is we're in this moment. We're, we're in this push and pull moment. And if we don't make sure that our work is sustainable, this will only be a moment. And we want to make sure that what we're doing will last. So how can we, how do we ensure that equity is just not for this moment, but it's sustainable enough to, to create the impact that we would like to see in our communities? And anybody can take that. You want me to go ahead, Mr. Scott? Go, Ms. Scott? Okay. All right. <laughs> see, this is, this is uh, in person, we'd be able to just glance at each other. I know, I was like, hey, no, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I'll say personally, it's um, any of the work that I've done um, has, has, 
I guess, been centered around uh, wanting to um, be of service. Um, a part of my Jesuit education, if there's anybody on here that's going to Jesuit institutions, um, wanted to serve the least of these. Um, and so that that'll always be reflected in the work that I do. Um, and so to make sure that it continues, I think you um, people in the field, people doing the work need to or it's not something they need to. I'll just say what I, I'll do. I'm completely dedicated to um, committing uh, my energy and, and professional and personal life to addressing these issues. Um, so because there's so many um, while I'm working on infant mortality now, I'm deeply, deeply uh, invested and interested in the rampant gun violence that we see um, in our country. Um, and in so many times, this issue is connected to that issue. Um, and, and well, like we say here at City Match and anyone who, who's like in a public health um, background, public health is everything. Um, we, we like to say here at City Match, MCH, maternal child health is everything. Um, but to make sure that the work continues, um, I'll say um, that I'm certainly dedicated to um, making sure that I'm focused and my efforts in any place that I'm at um, is focused on addressing these very, very persistent um, inequalities that it's almost embarrassing that they've continued for so many decades. Um, I, just in the, the space of infant mortality, while the numbers have um, reduced for every uh, racial group in the country, uh, it's still persistently high for women of color, especially uh, black women. So the numbers have gone down over the decades, but black women are still experiencing the highest numbers. And so, um, you know, I think if, if, if the workforce and, and people in the field take it personally, perhaps we will change it and, and, and the work will be sustained. Thank you for that. And thank you for your dedication. Dr. Scott? No. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I agree definitely with Mr. Shelton. As I started out saying that it's important that we incre create equity and power systems and meaning that we really look at sharing power, um, not only by ensuring diverse representation, but also redistributing resources um, to establish equitable decision making and implementation processes. We have to have everyone at the table. We have to stay away from such things as paternalism and monological approaches that are one-sided approaches. We have to stay away from tokenism. We have to be meaningful in the work that we do um, and really empower the community and making sure that we know they have the capability, but can do can we give them and make sure that they have the cap capacity to do what they do? And so a lot of times in our partnerships with community organizations, we make a lot of assumptions that, yes, we want to bring you on board. We want you to tell us what to do. We want to hear from you. But it's another thing to be able to do that, but then also to be able to support you in the work that you do. Um, and again, as I said, it's not about capability. We know community-based organizations, community-driven organizations do it everything with a little bit of nothing. But just think about providing the kind of support that they need and helping them to build their capacity. Then we can ensure that this work can go on even when we're long gone. And I think that that's something that we have to do in shifting that paradigm. Yeah, and you talked about, and you've mentioned this a couple of times about sharing power. And I, I do, I like to think about even shifting that power. As you said, um, one of my biggest, I, I guess, in, within maternal health as well is around research and um, sharing power and research. Our community-based organizations, we're a part of the community. We, we know that the community is holding up this work, but larger organizations often get the funding to you know, execute or trickle down that funding. And I would like to challenge larger organizations to make sure that, number one, that 
those dollars, those resources get to the community and trust the community to do the work. Um, another part of that is making sure that community researchers have the opportunity to build their research capacity. Because what happens when we don't get our papers out to the community? We've done all this great work, but our papers never get out. And this work could really be scaled, you know, to a national level. And so when we're not able to support community in research, then we still, we continue to see some of the same things that we're seeing now uh, when it comes to the data. We could move the needle much further if our community-based organizations really had the resources to do the work because, I mean, it's on the ground and it's happening. So I appreciate you bringing in um, power and continually bringing that into this conversation. So First, thank you all for your contributions. Thank you for the great work that you're doing. I know this is not just a career, but it's definitely heart and passion work for you. So what I want to do now is um, see if we have any questions. And if you do have questions, please remember that you can type them into the day one Q&A. So I see a couple coming up here. One, have you assessed pay equity within your organizations? Either of you can take that. Uh, we have within um, NicheQ, we are, again, part of our whole audit, um, not only pay within um, our staff and employees, but also within our contractors. We began to take a look about was there equitable pay around who we were bringing to the table. And so that is something that's ongoing. But definitely we have looked at that and are continuing to look at that. Thank you, Devon. Uh, being that we're at a um, state-funded institution, um, th those uh, figures are, are publicly available. And so I, I know for, for sure people have used um, uh, publicly available information to advocate for themselves. And, and I'll just answer that on the opposite side of the table as a a small organization that does quite a bit of contractual work, um, I did have to learn to advocate for myself and my organization when it came to um, different types of projects. And, you know, and I know that I can do the work, but really determining, you know, at what level I, I was able to do that work and what value, you know, the organization felt we brought to the table. And so I, and that did take a while for me to get to as well. So thank you for that question. Let's see what else we have here. I appreciate that one of the, what well, one of the panelists said about staff retention. So organizations building support to retain staff, especially people of color. What are some successful efforts you've seen to promote retention? Well, I can just speak for NicheQ. What we have done is for the uh, employees of color, um, if they'd like to, we've had just kind of lunch hours that we have people come together um, and, and talk amongst themselves, you can say, um, and to really be able to just talk about their experience within the organization. Um, and that's been probably very impactful. Um, the other things that we've done, again, within our uh, office equity hours and whatever, is try to provide an opportunity for um, all staff, but also people of color to be able to speak their truth and really respect their lived experiences. Um, is, it, is it an easy task to do? No, I, you know, I won't sit here and tell you, oh, we, we've got the magic bullet and we've done it. Um, but, you know, again, I think that we recognize the importance of, of having that collaboration and having that type of support. We've done some mentorship, too, with some of the senior staff of color um, and some of the new staff that we have coming on. Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing because even looking at all of the different um, diversity when you have millennium people of color versus <laughs> more senior people of color, we've had to really take a step back and look at, um, you know, what we think is right, might not necessarily be that. So it's been great in having that dialogue. And so I think the open communications 
again, like I said, is it perfect? No, but I think that we are slowly learning on how we can do that. Because it's one thing to recruit a bunch of people, but if they're not happy within their organization, what does that mean? If they're gone within six months or so. So we are trying different tactics and uh, uh, open for suggestions along the way. <laughs> now, I took some of those suggestions. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I'd say that this uh, reminds me of a lot of spaces I've been in. Um, I don't know how many students are on, but um, <laughs> as soon as you start undergrad, it, it, you are ushered toward the Black Student Union or the Black Student Association or, or whatever, whatnot. And there's just an assumption of we have a space and you, you all can be together and there'll be no problems. And well, no, um, as Dr. Scott mentioned, so in the workplace, you might have you know, different age, uh, age differences and, and generational differences and things like that. But um, I noticed this through my educational experience where everyone is at the time, I guess, were we millennials back then? I guess, I, um, I don't know. But, um, you know, you, you have people of color together, but we still have various different experiences. Um, that people from East Coast and West Coast, South, Midwest, we, we or different um, socioeconomic backgrounds. There, there's various differences, um, and so it's just it goes back to the point I meant, er, uh, mentioned earlier: um, of assumptions not being made. Because I think that's something that we we do quite a bit um, um, in this space at times. But um, I would say here at City Match, definitely. Uh, uh, spirit of open communication. Um, there was a time early on when I started on staff where we had a healing circle. If anyone's ever heard of that, um, and it, it actually helped um, everyone gain a greater perspective about the people that they work with. Um, it was a very vulnerable space, um, and you revealed. Um, what you wanted to, you, no one was, you know, forced to do anything. Um, but, you know, we had a facilitator, facilitators um, who um, asked various questions in a group environment or a, a two-on-two or one-on-one -on -one environment, excuse me. Um, and it helped you learn uh, greater um, things and, and the motivation of the people that you work with, no matter their, their gender or, or race or or, or um, you know, uh, stance in the organization. So I would recommend that um, to anyone in terms of retaining um, people of color. Thank you. And we have one last question. Um, I think we have yet yeah, time to answer. I see a number of very large organizations engaging in implicit bias training and other efforts that seem more performative than concrete and substantive. Can you speak a little to finding a balance between having patience and wanting to see more? And either of you can take that. I, I, the last word, I missed you, what you said. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question was around um, finding the balance between having patience and wanting to see more when organizations engage in implicit bias trainings that seem to just be performative as opposed to like concrete and sustainable? Oh, I think it's a balance. I, you know, again, I, I don't have the magic formula. Um, and as I said earlier about implicit bias training, as long as it's not looked at as you're just checking the box off and saying, oh, we've done implicit bias, but really, um, being able to to recognize that the differences and the challenges that we see in in employing a diverse population and also working with the diverse and working with a diverse population. Um, just give you a quick example. We have been testing out our ESAT and we just did it with a nonprofit organization. Um, and based on some of the re responses we got, we shared with the leadership team. And they were blown away about what people's perception, and we're looking at it from a perception, experience, and action. 
This is how we're looking because a person's perception can be one thing, but the experience on the job is another and the actions that are taken is another. And I think that that's something we have to keep in consideration when we're looking at that patience and embarking, and embarking on this implicit and explicit bias journey. So I would say, you know, patience is a virtue. I know we can get really frustrated. Um, and uh, again, it's really up to the leadership. And it's just how much we feel internally that we can champion this. Um, and again, we, we, we hope that people are truly committed to what they're saying that they are practicing what they're preaching. Um, but I think data, 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 evidence, there's enough articles and things that you can share among the staff and leadership that people can, can begin to really get a better understanding. So that's the only thing I can offer for that one. <laughs> and put it into policy. Exactly. So it's in writing. No. Did you have anything, Divine, before we close out? Yeah, yeah. Tell us to come off, Sarah. Do we have time, Sarah? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I would just uh, endorse uh, what Dr. Scott said. We, we've got to move past the individual actions of racism and, and talk about deeper institutional uh, form, structural uh, and institutional uh, forms of racism that um, happen every day and often. Um, and so I will repeat the, the folks that we've we've worked with before, Racial Equity Institute um, and Rise for Racial Justice, if you, your organization is interested in going down that path. Well, thank you both. This has been great. I can talk all day, so I'm going to drop it back off. <laughs> um, so, but this has been great. I appreciate your time and just appreciate you all having me here to, to moderate the conversation. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank well, you. And thank you from Chapel Hill. We had um, a lot of note taking, a lot of head nodding. And I think as a class, we're going to have a lot to be able to talk about from listening to all of your wise words. So thank you so much. And thank everyone out there for joining us today. Um, we are looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow at 9.30 Eastern Standard Time. So tomorrow we have two great general sessions. We have lots of interesting workshops and we are gonna close with a keynote that I am so excited about. We're gonna be hearing from Sonia Renee Taylor. So rest up tonight and log on tomorrow. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Bye. <laughs>